This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so um, I'm primarily a vegetable grower and been working with cover crops for uh, almost three decades. And so today I'm going to um, talk about kind of a pastiche of, of different techniques that I've used on my farm for different reasons. And, uh, you know, really the idea is, is how on a intensively managed vegetable cropping operation can you fit cover crops into where those vegetable crops are grown. And, um, and for myself personally, I didn't start, I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in suburbia and, and central Illinois. And I didn't go to uh, school, university in that, and agriculture or even science for that matter. I was an uh, English and Asian lit major. And so I really got into agriculture by, by reading, reading poetry, really. And so I thought there would be a, a nice to start off with an appropriate poem, which talks about cover crops, really frost seeding, uh, by Wendell Berry. And it seems appropriate now, even though this is dated February 2nd, 1968. In the dark of the moon, in flying snow, in the dead of winter, war spreading, families dying, in the world danger, I walked the rocky hillside sowing clover. So um, Wendell here is uh, frost seeding um, clover and probably has a nice heavy clay soil which uh, frost seeding works much better on than uh, the farm where most of my farming experience came from southern New Hampshire and that where we had a sandy loam. Well, you know, everybody today has been talking about all the beneficial effects of cover crops and green manures and just uh, uh, just uh, kind of reiterate some of them is the allopathic effects on the weed seed bank, interruption of pest and disease cycles, elevated microbial activity in soils, positive effect on soil moisture conservation, legume family fixing anywhere from 50 to 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and uh, the uh, attractive uh, capability of cover crops for beneficial and pollinating insects, and of course, addition of organic matter to your soils to promote soil health. So I'm just going to start off with some profiles of different cover crops on that, and, and these are really very common, used in the upper north, northeast. Uh, winter rye, or winter rye in combination with uh, hairy vetch. And uh, run through some photographs. Uh, we're uh, up farmed in um, southern New Hampshire, up to mid-coast Maine. There's uh, ideal windows for getting in uh, some of these cover crops, as uh, Thomas was definitely talking about, with uh, some of the cover crops he was talking about. In uh, winter rye, uh, there's a pretty long period of time that you can get your rye on from late August all the way into about now, if you want to gamble a little bit. But the window is much shorter for hairy vetch, and I've found that really mid-August to mid-September is the ideal time to uh, get that vetch in. In, uh, especially in combination with your winter rye. And uh, these two in combination overwinter really well. Um, the kill time or the termination time for um, rye would be very early in the spring if you can get into the fields and with the tillering stage or allow it to get to full maturity and add to the pollen stage and then uh, mow it at the pollen stage. And uh, with the vetch component in that and with uh, tillage, and uh, there is a lot of tillage uh, with uh, vegetable crop rotations in that, uh, the mineralization that will come off the rye and vetch will you know, feed most of your uh, cash crops from midsummer into, um, into later in the fall. So it's a great, great setup crop. With another use of uh, of uh, winter rye. It catches really nicely with the soil moisture in that. And so um, for um, fall, kind of widely spaced uh, single row or uh, crops, um, there's a great opportunity to get rye into your field uh, while you're still uh, growing your cash crop. In this case, um, broccoli transplanted um, 
uh, in, in August, and the rye is just spun on. Um, in mid-September, it's critical that your, um, your um, broccoli planting is, is clean from weeds and that, but uh, you don't need to press it in or, or uh, cultivate it in and that. You can just spin it on with the moisture and that. You can get a pretty good catch on most years. Broccoli will continue and the growth slows down in that shaded area where the, where the broccoli is. And then much later, after uh, broccoli's been cut off, and in this case, this field was much too wet to get in there with uh, implementing that, have a nice stand of, of winter rye to get you through the winter. Uh, I learned this trick from uh, uh, Thomas, uh, from uh, his uh, website, and that, and that is that sometimes you have a, 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 a field where you didn't get a cover crop in, in uh, in the late fall and the winter, it's bare. It uh, could be uh, weedy, and you schedule uh, uh, something that would go in there, say, in, in, um, in uh, uh, June. Um, that, that kind of bare window of time, it's a great time to put down some cheap seed like rye, and you'll flush some annual weeds through that. You'll kind of stimulate the microbial uh, soil life in that with that rye. And, uh, and also it will be scavenging some leftover nitrogen in that, so you can use this rye as really like a starter fertilizer. The trick is not to let it get very much growth, four to six inches. And then the tillage, um, you don't need aggressive tillage in that, it's just the uh, perfecta, to pass the perfecta, the field was ready to go, and then I was able to then transplant uh, summer, um, summer squash and, and, uh, and winter squash in this little block here, but to basically use it as a biostimulant and, uh, and a, a weed uh, suppressant. For many years I've worked with the idea of, uh, of strips with overwintered rye or overwintered rye and vetch, and, um, and instead of using a crimper in that, um, which will kind of kill your rye and vetch in that, but the ground stays kind of cool in the crimper, uh, most of my farming experience is a little further north in the northeast and that I want that soil to warm up in that for um, what I intend to put into these strips and that so I um, um, I would with a spader uh, early in the spring uh, cut strips in my field of overwintered rye and vetch and then I was able to direct seed uh, winter squash or pumpkins in the alternating strips but strips are wide enough that that soil gets warm before I put the seed in, and I let the rye vetch continue to grow, so I'm getting a fair amount of uh, biomass and straw mulch from that. And then, then at that termination time, which is the, um, the winter rye and the pollen stage, and the uh, vetch beginning to, to flower, this case is probably a little bit far advanced in that, uh, mow it down. And you have a nice uh, straw uh, between, your, between your beds of uh, winter squash or pumpkins. I'm still able to cultivate the pumpkins. The ground's warm there. And then, uh, and then kind of refinement of this technique. Um, if I want to get a, a fall cover crop in a field that's very hard to get a cover crop in when the, at the time with the squash and pumpkins would come off in mid, late September in that, using the kind of establishing living mulch strips of medium red clover. And so just at the stage of where the tendrils start to move out on the uh, pumpkin plants here, and that movement is very quick, um, I'll do a shallow um, tillage and then drop clover seed in. It's very important that there's moisture in the soil to get good germination. The cully packer press that seed in. It'll germinate. Different field, same thing. And then the, the broad leaves from the um, pumpkins or winter squash and that shade that clover so the, shade, the clover doesn't really interfere with the growth of the um, winter squash in that. And then as the squash and pumpkins comes out of the field in that, very important to get it out of the field as quickly as you can, mow off that, um, that crop residue and that so the, um, the clover strips can get light And then here in the fall, I'm, you know, I get my, my fall cover crop established, but it was seeded back in July. 
and with the liberation of light to the clover in that, then it'll fill in, this, fill in the field. And that different field here is butternut, same thing. The butternuts come out, strips are there. And here we are in November. And then that uh, clover has filled in the field. And then next spring, get you know really nice clean stand of clover uh, and you get the nitrogen that's coming off that clover and then I'll flip families in that so I'm using it establishing with the cucubit family and I'll cut strips in that field of red clover and I'm um, transplanting tomatoes it's kind of hard to see the tomato plants are very small in this slide and uh, and and so I'm just kind of changing plant families and I use the clover as a straw mulch for the tomatoes Johnny's, um, you know, they were a little hesitant to see some of these techniques brought on to their farm. So um, there's just kind of like a little bit of refinement of this technique. Uh, this is last spring in that on field. There's a lot of crop residue. We got the plastic out and, uh, and uh, basically uh, harrowed the field, marked, marked all my beds. And then any bed that I was going to have in plastic, plastic, whoops, uh, plastic mulch. Um, I seeded, seeded all any strips to um, uh, oats and, uh, and um, medium, medium red clover. The oats is a nurse crop for the clover, use a cauliflower, pack it in, and then I continue with the um, spot transplanting in, in the areas that we're going to, um, that are in the plastic mulch and that, as, as those crops are available. And then um, manage the by mowing it and also you're flushing a lot of the annual weed seeds for the clover so it's a technique you're managing your weed seed bank with the clover and again there's no bare soil here there's no bare soil cultivation in that um, but the clover is not interfering with uh, you know your cash crop in this place in this case eggplant and then here we are um, early October taking the plastic out not easy, you know, there's really not an easy way to get that plastic out. In this case, I was using biotallow, but in other fields, you're using uh, kind of non biotallow kind of conventional plastic mulch, but getting that plastic out. And then with, uh, with the light, and that migrates in. And so there's no fall uh, tillage, and you have a good stand of, uh, of clover in that, in that field. And then uh, modification of this. In uh, tomatoes, this is at Johnny's and that, same thing. Basically start off with a bare soil, seed your, um, your oats and medium red clover. And then here we're using uh, straw mulch instead of plastic. So this is straw mulch that we had baled at our farm. And first the uh, clover and oats are established. And then we transplant the tomatoes in the bare soil. Important for that bare soil to be warm so the soil can warm up where we are. And then, then bring, bring the mulch into the tomato plants. Here you can see the straw mulch with the, uh, with the clover strips. And then the management, again, with mowing in that, so we're flushing our annual weeds through there. But what I liked about this, um, with the straw mulch instead of the plastic, with the plastic, we'd have a little weed, uh, kind of a weed strip right on that edge in that, and created a kind of a challenge for managing those weeds on that strip. But with the, um, with the straw mulch and that, I, I could drive my tractor tire onto that, onto that straw and, and I, you know, the management of the weeds in that, in that field with the straw instead of the plastic and that was phenomenally faster. Just run that mower through there, it can run it right up on the straw. And have nice airflow, good harvest aisles for the tomatoes and that. You know, that's how they would, you know, have a well-established field. And then, and then in the fall, take out the stakes and the string, tomatoes, mow it, and, uh, and then you have kind of straw. And I found that the, I didn't get the, of the migration of the clover into the straw. It really seemed to impede a little bit. I think if we use less straw, I'd probably get better migration of it. But the point is, is that a nice cover going into the winter and good stands of clover. And then this, this year, we planted our winter squash and pumpkin nursery into those clover strips without any additional fertilizer in that and had a, 
you know, on, on a 100 day crop and that had very good uh, crops of uh, pumpkins and, and winter squash from the clover that was established the previous year. But you know, the key is that there's almost no tillage for two years and almost no bare soil for two years once you do the initial setup of the field in that. Also works well on you know, crops like uh, sunflowers, cut flowers. Again, we're flushing annual weeds through the clover just wider spacing and after a couple of mowings um, the, um, in that case the amaranth is gone. I found this technique works really well for gallon soga. Uh, I've read that the gallon soga seed has a very short term viability about a year and a half and so if you have um, uh, fields that are infested with gallon soga if you can shut off all kind of cultivation and tillage for two seasons. You can really blow a hole in your weed seed bank of viable gallon soga seeds. So if you can use this technique with the clover in that, the gallon soga will just, it, it'll head out just above the clover. And so you just mow it, you just clip off those heads, do it four or five times. And then there, you know, then you can, you know, there'll be no gallon soga in that field. Plus all the weeds, I mean, the, the, the clover seed, and I'm sorry, the, the gallon soga seed that's in the soil and that is breaking down in that. So it, this is a great technique to eliminate gallon soga on a vegetable farm, which is a problem in a lot of vegetable farms, induced by all that cultivation and bare soil. Um, another way just to think about cover crops is how to fit them in and that is actually turn cover crops into cash, a cash crop, a valuable cash crop. So for many years, um, I've utilized uh, field peas uh, as, a, as a summer fallow. Uh, nurse with oats, just spin it on. Three to one, kind of three, three parts of uh, field peas to one part oats. I've done trials of about 15 varieties of field peas and I'm looking for a tender and juicy and, and non-powdery mildew susceptible variety of, of uh, field pea in that and, and uh, Maxim at Johnny's. Uh, is one variety I find that works very well and many varieties that don't work so well and um, and after about four weeks of growth of the field peas when they first come out the shoots are tough so you, they need to have enough growth and so that that with your finger you can snap them when they snap and that then they're tender and it's a great stir fry green it's very popular in Asian cuisine also a kind of new American chefs uh, I used to sell to 35 restaurants, and so I was getting $9, $10 a pound for the pea shoots for the restaurant trade, but it was the only thing I sold straight wholesale market terminal, Chelsea market terminal to a broker, the market terminal. I was getting $4.50 a pound for my broker there, and I was selling you know, from uh, 40 to 80 cases a week through the market terminal. Then. So I would stagger my seedings of field peas and oats to try to extend my, my supply of the field peas and oats. Um, for that cash crop value as well as getting all the benefits of having this fallow field of, of you know tillage, weed suppression, you'd get off that, build up of organic matter and also the nitrogen that come off the field peas and that. Um, as the maximum variety, and there are a few other varieties of, of uh, field peas and that, you know the, the, the flowers have different colors and that, I found the chefs really like the purple flower you got off the maximum. And also just use that little little point where the flour is in that and I would add that in my salad mix. It was a great bulking agent for the salad mix and the pea flour has a beautiful pea flavor. And I was getting in a clamshell uh, 50 count uh, pea blossoms for $20 a clamshell and, and selling many hundreds of pounds, uh, I mean uh, many hundreds of dollars of value off those uh, pea blossoms. Also has white flour, some varieties, that's kind of the, that's the length of the pea shoot. And then uh, if I wanted to extend that season, you could use it for just get one flush and then have cash crops come on the backside of field peas and, and oats. Or you could double up and, and, and designate a whole field for a whole season in that. And so uh, a lot of the acreage, that's what I would do. I would um, let the uh, oats and the field pea mature, but it wouldn't have to be combine mature, just, just start to have a bit of a seed coat to it. And then I would mow it. I use the spader, one pass of the spader, which is a less aggressive tillage tool, but you know it is. It still is a tillage uh, tool for sh for certain. So that's one pass of the spader. I get that residue into the ground. 
you need moisture to sprout it, so you either do it with rain, whoops, um, or with irrigation. And then here's your second flush later in August, and then you have another, another round going into the fall of your pea shoots, and that as well as all that biomass. Very dry last two years at Johnny's, so definitely had to irrigate it in midsummer. There it is at Johnny's, really nice flush back in August. And then, then that will winter kill. Um, if we have mild, you know, if you have a mild fall in that, you don't want the oats in that second flush to set mature seed in that, so you might mow it down as that oat seed. If, if it's a little juicy, you want to mow it down before it, it hardens up in that, so you don't have a problem with that as a volunteer the next spring. And then I found that I used a much less aggressive tillage uh, after the field pea and oat residue and that kind of got wet and, and softened that through the winter and that very easy to work for uh, uh, early spring crops and that with no additional fertilization other than you know adjusting for pH and that. And most of my direct seeded crops my following spring would come off of the field pea and oat fallow. Sudan grass, uh, just a great builder of organic matter and a weed suppressant. Uh, you want to seed it thick. I broadcast it, but you can just seed drill. Um, what I found is that if I let the Sudan grass get the full maturity in that, it's so stocky and ligny that it's hard to break it down through the winter the next year in that. So I would mow it three times, not let it get any higher than waist high. And also it would, um, I find that it, it would, uh, the root mass in that would get thicker from that mowing in that. Uh, you'd have you know, no weeds in that uh, understory of the Sudan grass. And then sometimes I wanted to, uh, with this, this summer fowl and that, get a clover established in the backside. And so just before my third mowing, I would drop medium red clover seed into the Sudan grass and then mow it so that the residue would be a mulch. And then here's just uh, my first year I did it and that you know, part of the field, they just did a straight Sudan grass, let it winter kill. And the uh, other part of the field, I did this technique. And now I've used, I've used it up in Johnny's. It works really well on, if you have kind of dry, sandy soils in that, that mulch in that is a nice kind of nurse material for that clover underneath it and that. And then you'll have a nice stand of clover they will take you into the next, next uh, spring. Buckwheat, Thomas talked about that. It's just a, it's a great, great interruption. Uh, summer um, cover crop, great smother crop. It's also really good for uh, harboring beneficial insects, bees and otherwise. And so um, I would always, in, in fields of, um, in this, this case, um, Brussels sprouts, but in, in brassica fields, that um, every 20th bed in that I would put a bed of, of uh, buckwheat, stagger those beds and they would be insecti areas and I had to bring my beneficials in. I found that there's a, a predator wasp that likes to crack open the back of uh, imported cabbage worm in that. And so if you um, have these little stands of, of uh, flowering buckwheat in that, it's a great uh, attractant for bringing in some of these, these wasps in that that really can knock out your uh, cabbage worms in that. Also, they're a great, great uh, crop for uh, honeybees. Uh, Kim Stoner. At, at uh, the Connecticut uh, Experiment Station that has done a lot of work on evaluating different cover crops and what beneficial insects they bring in. And this is kind of a hard slide to read in that, but the point of it is is that um, she was looking at, at honeybees and, and bumblebees. Bumblebees build their nests in the ground, so ground tillage and that disturbance and that is going to take that native bee out of your, off your farm. And that, you know, honeybees, of course, you know, they were managing honeybees with, with uh, uh, your beehives and that, but not all flowering cover crops are going to attract the, the same, same insect in that. So for medium red clover in that, it's attractive to bumblebees, but not honeybees. And uh, as opposed to, say, buckwheat is, is attractive to uh, honeybees, but not bumblebees. And there are, uh, are a few. Um, of these flowering cover crops like white clover that are attractive to both honeybees and bumblebees. So it's kind of like know your bees and know your cover crop and, and you can use them to uh, bring in uh, something into your, into your fields. And buckwheat is great. It's really easy to knock down. I, I really like buckwheat as a setup for fall carrots and that to really clean your soil up for direct seeded carrots and that. It's just a great setup crop for that. 
And, uh, and again, I found that if I'm not going to put a fall crop on the backside of, of a buckwheat in that, just before you mow that flowering buckwheat down, if you can drop medium red clover down, then mow it, then run a coldy packer over it, you get a nice stand of clover taking into the, into the fall. Um, equipment in that for cover crops. Um, it's good that you, know, you want to match up the widths of your implements uh, to your bed, bed widths and that, so you can work with these strips and that. Um, it's also important that if you're going to set aside cropland to cover crops and that, you know, it, it, they're not you know, run by automatic pile net, you need to manage them. Irrigation is very important to be able to kind of mitigate drought stress on cover crops, and so you want to think about that. And, uh, you know, and so that there's a commitment to getting these cover crops in, not as an afterthought. So uh, all my equipment will kind of match up for my purposes of using cover crops and that, and the bed width of my tractors. I mean, uh, an implement that I brought on the Johnny's that was a, a discovery for me. It's very stony soil for a lot of the fields we have there. So like a spader would not work well there for cutting strips. And so this is kind of like a hybrid perfecta in that, but instead of having those s tine sweeps in that, it has two gangs of discs, and then you have the, the rakes and the roller bar in the back. But it's great for cutting strips if you get in there early. And it makes a nice level seed bed. And uh, also it's a nice, nice uh, uh, bed to also be laying plastic on. All kinds of uh, implements for seeding and that, from you know, fertilizers, spreaders, to seed drills. We do a lot of our seeding just by, by uh, hand seeders. Nothing wrong with that. It's a nice feel that was seeded with the seed drill. But when I'm using the seed drill and spin on, you know, almost every time I'm putting cover crops on, because I really want to get a good catch in that, I'll put a coldy packer on the backside. I think that coldy packer on the backside is just a good guarantee that you get good seed to soil contact. And, and you want to seed with moisture. Either, either moisture is coming or there's good moisture in the field to get a good stand. You do not want to seed in kind of desert dry conditions. That's a recipe for disaster with, with cover crops. And just pictures of cover, you can buy cully packers without, without uh, seed, seed hoppers and that. I'll just kind of skip quickly and just to end in that, Vern talked about this, but there are, you know, I've been thinking recently, there's a lot of uh, high tunnels at Johnny's and that, looking for ideal candidates in a high tunnel environment. So I'm looking for something that might be a legume, uh, might have something to do with, with biofumigation, easy to manage, easy with hand tillage to knock down. So fenugreek is one, it's a 35 day legume. It's also a high value cash crop for East Indian community. Uh, whoops. Uh, that's what it looks like. Here it is in a high tunnel. And the other one is biofumigant mustards in that. And easy to manage, very thick. And cut and come again. And uh, with that, we'll, we'll stop because I'm over, I'm over time here. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.